This is Michael Altos recording part two of Autonomic Nervous System number one, Physiology and Neurotransmitters and Cholinergic Drugs. Now we're going to go back to the cholinergic system and focus on receptors. We've already said that acetylcholine is the neurotransmitter of the cholinergic system. Acetylcholine receptors come in two kinds, the nicotinic and the muscarinic receptors. The nicotinic receptor can be found on the cell bodies of all postganglionic neurons, which are in the ganglia of both the sympathetic and the parasympathetic system. So acetylcholine can excite both systems then, because it excites in every single ganglion. These are called nicotinic receptors because nicotine also excites them, activates them. And so we see that at low doses, acetylcholine actually has its predominant effect at the adrenal medulla. And patients will secrete epinephrine and norepinephrine and have hypertension and tachycardia. But at higher doses, acetylcholine or nicotine will act as a ganglionic uh, blocker and cause hypotension or weakness. I also want to remind you that we've seen acetylcholine receptors in the neuromuscular junction, and these are also nicotinic acetylcholine receptors. And therefore, we now know that the nicotinic receptor can be blocked by non-depolarizing neuromuscular blocking agents. The second receptor is the muscarinic receptor, which is found on the cell membranes of the effector tissues. And acetylcholine, or muscarine, will actually mimic the peripheral nervous system because they will activate the target organs of the parasympathetic system. Therefore, these substances can be excitatory or inhibitory. It just depends on the target tissue. If you refer back to the chart that we looked at in the last lecture, you can see how the acetylcholine uh, that is secreted by the parasympathetic system has excitatory or inhibitory effects depending on the target tissue. Muscarinic acetylcholine receptors also exist on the presynaptic membrane of the sympathetic nervous nerve terminals. And so when these get stimulated, it inhibits the release of norepinephrine. I wouldn't call this a negative feedback loop, but it's sort of a competitive feedback loop where we see that part of the um, result of releasing acetylcholine in the cholinergic system is to go back and inhibit release of norepinephrine from the adrenergic system. Atropine is the prototype muscarinic blocker. Atropine works on muscarinic acetylcholine receptors. And for that reason, atropine is called a sympathomimetic drug. Atropine acts like a catecholamine because atropine blocks the function of acetylcholine at the muscarinic receptor. And so atropine blocks the parasympathetic response and therefore it acts like a catecholamine. So now we can start looking at our schematic again, and we can't look at the... Well, let's start by looking at the parasympathetic system. So here is a parasympathetic nerve fiber, a preganglionic fiber, probably from the vagus nerve, and it goes to a parasympathetic ganglion, which as we can see is far away from the um, spinal cord or from the brain stem and close to the target vessel. The ganglion has a nicotinic acetylcholine receptor in it, and acetylcholine is secreted by the preganglionic fiber, and it activates the postganglionic fiber, which is relatively short, and goes to its target vessel. Here we have some heart or blood vessels. Acetylcholine is also the neurotransmitter here, and it binds to a muscarinic acetylcholine receptor. And what would be the function of this um, acetylcholine? What would be the effect at the heart? Well, it would cause bradycardia, which is what the parasympathetic system does. And this is what the vagus nerve does with its resting tongue.
But we've also seen now that acetylcholine has some other functions. Acetylcholine is not in only the parasympathetic ganglion, but it's in all of the ganglia, binding to nicotinic acetylcholine receptors. So acetylcholine is everywhere. There are a few rare cases in the sympathetic system where acetylcholine is the second neurotransmitter, specifically in sweat glands and in certain blood vessels, but this is really an exception. There are drugs which bind to and antagonize the acetylcholine receptor. We call these cholinergic antagonists or anticholinergic drugs. Most of the anticholinergic drugs are meant to act at the muscarinic receptor. And just looking back for a moment, that's because the muscarinic receptor is the target vessel. If you made an anticholinergic that bound at the nicotinic receptor, it would affect sympathetic and parasympathetic fibers. Most of these drugs are aromatic acid esters, which bind to and competitively block activation by acetylcholine. We can guess what the effects of these drugs would be. So in the cardiac system, blocking parasympathetic activity would mean reversing bradycardia. And if a patient is bradycardic due to a vagal reflex, atropine or one of these other drugs, like glycopyrrolate, could be used to reverse that bradycardia. We do sometimes see a paradoxic effect where a low dose of atropine can cause slowing of the heart rate. This may be due to some selective inhibition of transmission through the AV node. But in general, we do see that anticholinergic drugs will block vagal activity in the SA node, which will increase heart rate, and facilitate conduction through the AV node improving transmission of heart rate into the ventricles. In the pulmonary system, anticholinergic drugs relax bronchial smooth muscle. In fact, if you've ever heard of the drug Atrovent, Atrovent is atropine in the inhaled form. In the eyes, anticholinergic drugs will cause mydriasis, which is dilation of the pupils and it will cause urinary retention in the genital urinary system. As we said before, atropine is sort of the paradigm of anticholinergic drugs. Atropine is a tertiary amine, and just looking back at the previous slide for a moment, we see here is the atropine, here is the nitrogen, and it is a tertiary amine with one, two, three bonds. Tertiary amines are uncharged. In the heart, atropine is our first choice for severe Brady arrhythmias, and the side effect naturally is tachycardia. This tachycardia can increase oxygen demand, and so atropine should be used carefully in patients who have coronary artery disease. In the lungs, as we said before, it can be inhaled as a drug called ipratropium. And ipratropium is atropine, but it's in quaternary ammonium structure, which means it's charged, and so it really stays in the lungs and is not absorbed through the membranes into systemic circulation. However, atropine, when we inject it, is a tertiary amine, and it's uncharged, which means it can cross the blood-brain barrier. Now, usually the effect of this is minimal. But we should keep this in mind because atropine can cause memory deficits, it can cause people to become disoriented or have other CNS excite, excitement, and can even lead to a condition called central anticholinergic syndrome, which is treated with physostigmine, which is the, which is the um, similar to neostigmine, but it crosses the blood-brain barrier. Other uses of atropine include an anti-sialagogue, which means an anti-salivary medication. Atropine should be used with caution in patients who have narrow angle glaucoma. The usual dose is somewhere between 0.4 and 0.6 milligrams IV, 
For total blockade of the vagus nerve, you may need one or even two milligrams. And typically, we don't recommend doses below 0.4 milligrams because of the paradoxic bradycardia that can occur. Atropine usually lasts for about 30 minutes. <clears throat> the next anticholinergic drug we'll discuss is scopolamine, which is also a tertiary amine. This is a very good anti-sialagogue, even better than atropine, but it also has even more pronounced CNS effects. It can lead to a significant amount of sedation or amnesia, and in fact, it's used as an anti-emetic, and many of you have seen the scopolamine patch that we put behind a patient's ear, commonly used for post-operative nausea and vomiting, or for motion sickness. Similarly to atropine, Scopolamine should be used with great caution in patients who have narrow angle glaucoma. Glycopyrrolate, probably the anticholinergic drug we're most familiar with, is a quaternary ammonium, which means it's charged. And just looking back in the slides for a moment, we can see our picture of glycopyrrolate here with one, two, three, four bonds, and therefore it has a positive charge. As a result of that charge, glycopyrrolate does not cross the blood-brain barrier, does not cause CNS or ophthalmologic side effects. It's still a very good anti sialagogue and a great premedication if you want to reduce secretions. It tends to have a, a slightly longer duration of action than atropine. And just bear in mind that atropine is 0.4 milligrams per milliliter, but glycopyrrolate is 0.2 milligrams per milliliter. However, the dosing is typically half as well, and so practically you end up giving the same volume of drug whether you're giving atropine or glycopyrrolate. Take a moment to jot down any questions you have, and then we'll move on. So we've discussed the cholinergic receptors, the nicotinic and muscarinic acetylcholine receptors. Now we're going to discuss the adrenergic receptors, and these are also subdivided into categories alpha and beta, and we'll talk for a moment about the dopaminergic receptors as well. The alpha receptors are subdivided into first alpha-1. The alpha-1 receptors are found really only on postsynaptic membranes of effector tissues, and they are the most abundant receptors. It is an excitatory receptor. When it's activated, it increases intracellular calcium. And they're found specifically on the smooth muscles of many different organs, including coronary arteries, skin, uterus, intestines, renal beds, GI, splanchnic beds. And when the alpha-1 receptor is stimulated, it causes vasoconstriction and GI relaxation. So this here is our fight or flight response. GI relaxation, which means the GI system is not going to be active, but instead we'll have vasoconstriction in order to push blood into the central compartment to facilitate the fight or flight response. There is a little bit of increase in cardiac contractility as well. The alpha-2 receptors are a little bit strange. There are many subtypes which we won't go into. But for our purposes, let's think of the alpha-2 receptor as an inhibitory receptor, which decreases cyclic AMP in the effector cells. There may be some, there are some postsynaptic alpha-2 adrenergic receptors. And when they are activated, they cause also some arterial and venous vasoconstriction. They also have some action in platelets and in insulin. But for our purposes, mostly we think of the alpha-2 receptor as being presynaptic. Why is it on the presynaptic part of the nerve terminal? Because it's part of a negative feedback loop. When norepinephrine is released, it binds to the alpha-2 receptor on the presynaptic terminal, which then inhibits further release of norepinephrine. So it's a negative feedback loop to keep the system in check, thus reducing sympathetic outflow and actually leading to vasodilation and some sedation. So this is a little bit hard to understand when norepinephrine is being secreted. It's causing 
excitatory actions at the alpha-1 receptor and inhibitory receptors at the alpha-2 receptor. And we just need to think of it as a checks and balances system involving negative feedback. But later on, in a couple weeks, we'll talk about drugs that target only the alpha-2 receptor and see how we can capitalize on that receptor. Next, we'll talk about the beta receptors. Beta adrenergic receptors are usually G protein coupled receptors which increase cyclic AMP. The beta 1 receptors are only found on postsynaptic neurons. Most of the beta receptors are in the heart. And the mnemonic I always learned between beta 1 and beta 2 was one heart and two lungs. So the beta 1 receptors are mostly in the heart and the beta 2 are mostly in the lungs. What do these beta 1 receptors do in the heart? They increase heart rate and contractility. They cause coronary dilation, which is good for increased work of the heart. And they tend to bind epinephrine and norepinephrine pretty much equally. The beta 2 receptors are more inhibitory. They cause vasodilation, bronchodilation, and some veno renal vessel relaxation. They have more affinity for epinephrine than norepinephrine. And often, circulating epinephrine stimulates them more than direct sympathetic activity. They do have some cardiac effects, so they will increase heart rate and contractility some, but that's not the primary effect of the beta-2 receptor. And they may have some presynaptic function as well, accelerating release of norepinephrine and causing vasoconstriction. Finally, there are dopamine receptors, which primarily are involved with the kidneys. When dopamine binds to the dopamine receptor, it increases renal perfusion and stimulates diuresis. So now we can see the entire schematic here. We've already discussed the parasympathetic system. Now we can look at the sympathetic system. Remember that the ganglion is still being uh, stimulated by acetylcholine at the nicotinic acetylcholine receptor. And this is true for all of the different sympathetic ganglia. But now we can focus a little bit more on the postganglionic fibers of the sympathetic system. So most of the fibers are adrenergic fibers, releasing norepinephrine, binding to an alpha or a beta adrenergic receptor. The two exceptions are when we have cholinergic postganglionic sympathetic fibers. We mentioned this already. These secrete acetylcholine. And this is pretty much limited to sweat glands. Coming down over here, we see the adrenal gland. The adrenal gland also gets acetylcholine binding to its nicotinic fiber, nicotinic receptor, because we said the adrenal gland is almost like a ganglion. But instead of having a second nerve fiber, it secretes epinephrine and some norepinephrine directly into the blood. And those are circulating catecholamines, which eventually find alpha and beta receptors. And finally, the dopaminergic sympathetic fibers, which release dopamine at the renal uh, blood vessels, and they have their action at that point. This chart goes over the different neurotransmitters and describes the differences between their site of release the receptors they bind to, and what happens to that neurotransmitter after it has left the receptor. Acetylcholine being broken down by acetylcholinesterase, as we saw, norepinephrine being taken back up into the nerve terminal and metabolized by MAO and COMT, and epinephrine, which we know is mostly circulatory, being taken to the liver for hepatic COMT metabolism. If you have any questions, please write them down, and you can email me or bring them to class so I can clarify things for you. The last thing I want to discuss before we end this session is heart transplants. It's important to discuss this because it does show up on board exams from time to time. But even if you practice in a relatively straightforward setting, you may take care of patients for non-cardiac surgery who have a history of heart transplant. And understanding patients with heart transplant help us understand autonomic physiology.
when a patient receives a new heart, that heart has had its nerve connections cut. Now over a period of years to decades, maybe 10 to 15 years, there may be some re innervation of that heart. But in general, we call a transplanted heart a denervated heart, which means it does not have any baseline parasympathetic innervation. It has no vagus nerve and no vagal tone. Now we said the vagus nerve causes bradycardia, and we said that the vagus nerve has some baseline tone, and so we expect that patients who have a heart transplant will have a resting heart rate of close to 90 to 100. That's the heart rate you get when the vagus nerve is not providing constant tone. And as a result, if patients become bradycardic, you can't give them atropine or glycopyrrolate in order to block the parasympathetic system because they have no vagal input into their heart. These drugs won't work. In fact, when patients are being considered for a diagnosis of brain death, which means that their brain and their cranial nerves aren't working, that would mean the vagus nerve is also not working. And one of the tests for brain death is to give atropine and see if the patient has a tachycardic response. If the patient has no vagal input because their brain is dead and their vagus nerve is not transmitting, then atropine will have no effect. So how do we treat bradycardia in patients who have a heart transplant? We need to use agents that directly affect the heart. Drugs like isoproteranol, which we'll discuss later, and it is a direct beta agonist, or glucagon. Epinephrine and norepinephrine may actually have an exaggerated beta effect on the heart because there's no vagal tone. And in patients who have a heart transplant, when blood pressure goes up, they will not have the normal reflex slowing of heart rate because that's mediated by the vagus nerve. And what would happen if you did give atropine or glycopyrrolate to these patients? Well, you could actually cause some paradoxic slowing of the heart rate, just like we described when you give a low dose of atropine to a regular patient. You can actually cause some AV block in these patients, and so atropine and glycopyrrolate are often not used in patients who have a heart transplant. One other point I just want to mention is that when patients have a heart transplant, they can't mount the normal tachycardic and contractility response to hypotension or hypovolemia. So it's very important to make sure these patients have adequate preload and a full tank of intravascular volume because they won't mount the tachycardic response when they become hypovolemic. That's all for this session. We'll stop here. And next week, we'll go into more detail about the adrenergic system.